Hello and welcome to the latest episode of The Brass Junkies. I am your host, Andrew Hitz, and I am in the Berkshires in the summertime, so I am in a very good mood. Lance, how are you? I'm awesome. I'm in Pittsburgh in the summertime. <laughs> is Pittsburgh That's weird that we are both in the summertime. It is it, it is uh, quite a coincidence. So, um and Pittsburgh and the Berkshires are, are quite similar. Uh, we have actually one of our um we get nine nice days a year and this is one of them. So there's no better day to be indoors uh, doing this because it's like 75 and sunny, big puffy clouds. <laughs> Well, um, we get another one of these in October, so well, I'm cool. We will schedule something for that day. So uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure. I think I need you to guest on TEM that day. So we'll just Fine. we'll just book it ahead of time. How's that? Wonder. I can't even spell TEM. Uh, <laughs> so today's uh, today's guest is uh, is a fellow jackass. Actually, um, he's yeah. he's a he's a composer and he's a knucklehead and he's a good friend of ours, uh, Pete Meekin, who's. Uh, British dude who lives in Canada, because you know that makes sense. The extradition, I think, was there. Were, I can't remember exactly what the details were. It was on CNN before everything else started. Blowing. And so the, now he's small news. And the BBC, yeah, just Google it. So, um, it. yeah, just Google Pete Meekin scandal, and I'm sure I'm sure it'll pop up. <laughs> if enough people Google, <laughs> if enough people Google it, maybe we could confuse Google. So right. Well, well yeah. who knew you couldn't do that with a clown car? I didn't know. I mean, how are you supposed to know? There's no rules on like you don't. There's no like clown car driving school. How is he supposed to know? I thought it was a good idea. I, I can't believe he had the stones to actually attempt it. But you know, whatever. yeah, I can't. Yeah, that's right. He's still got most of his fingers. So. I bet he's. I bet he is peeing himself laughing right now, at uh, at this intro. This is this is a good one. Um, so. Uh, Pete is awesome. He's a he's an incredible uh, human. He's an incredible composer, um, and he's a knucklehead. So he's like that's like the that's like the holy trinity for the three for for you and me. That's right. <laughs> great person, great artist, and a knucklehead. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, there, there you go. That's uh, th- those are my people right there. So. Um, we got to thank uh, Parker Mouthpieces for providing the hosting for. Uh, I, I almost said I almost said TEM. Uh, this is not uh, not T. I'm in summer mode here. Um, for what the hell is this? The Brass Junkies, right? Yes, I think so. Yeah, good. Where we interview uh, uh, British-born Canadian uh, artists. So this is episode one. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, fine. euphonium, and tuba, including Sweet. the Andrew Hits Artist Model Tuba Mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc Model Euphonium Mouthpiece. Whoop, whoop. Pete Meekin's uh, music sounds extra good on a Parker mouthpiece. I can say that with uh, with authority. Uh, find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Um, we also uh, need to thank uh, some people in uh, in Pittsburgh who are hopefully not do indeed. indoors like you are. I hope that's true, too. Uh, we need to thank the nice folks at the Mary Patrick School of Music of Duquesne University in the Brass Department. Specifically, if you want to find out about all the goings on going on and who you can study with. And uh, except for me, it's mostly folks from the Pittsburgh symphony. Um, you can click you, in you the go show to the notes symphony and you'll get sometimes. a link. Mm, we'll go with that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been, I've been. <laughs> When's the last time you went to the Pittsburgh symphony? Uh, the last time I went to Heinz hall. No, that's not what I asked. Uh, last time, oh, I went, oh, here's the last time I went. When you weren't on stage. It was, oh, (laughs) uh, about a year and a half ago. I don't believe you. They have these, no, this is true. They have these mute, what what do they call it? Muse concerts where they combine this particular one. They're actually kind of cool. This particular one combined, um, Appalachian Spring with the songs of Boney Bear and they've done, like Bjork and Bartok and uh, Radiohead and Brahms and there's like these mashups. And um, I went to that. <clears throat> and uh, actually, Beauty Slap played at the end with uh, um, Gabe and Hakeem, who have been prior guests on the Brass Junkies. So that's the last time I went and saw the Pittsburgh Symphony perform. I don't really believe you, but that was a very nice save. So It's true. It's yeah. actually true. So anyway, if you would like to uh, study with the people that Lance doesn't go support, (laughs) 
two it was two years ago and I think about it. <laughs> if we I keep, support them emotionally. If we, I live the, up the street from Zach and around the corner from Pete and down the street from from Craig Knox. So yeah, I mean I, I'm I'm doing my best to support them emotionally. Well I was gonna say, what do you do? Yard work for? You like cut Craig's grass or something? Or what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea yeah it is a good idea so there, you're welcome craig uh so what do people want to do if they are uh, thinking about going to study with these incredibly go to the show colors? notes and you you in the show notes you click on the link and it'll take you straight to a page that is specifically set up for fans of the brass junkies who are interested in finding out more about the brass program at duquesne university and that was thanks to jim nova jim nova's a dear friend and He's the guy who does those recordings of, um, he did the Galaxy Quest uh, soundtrack, I think, and The Last Starfighter, Tron, I think he did. Uh, I can't remember. Maybe space some, balls. maybe some, space st- balls, yes, Spaceballs, that's it. That's what he's most known for, is all the Spaceballs <laughs> arrangements. <laughs> May the Schwartz be with you. All right, and a Facebook message will be incoming to both Lanta and I from Jim about an hour after this posts on Tuesday. Well, especially so. because he threw down the gauntlet. I didn't tell you, Andrew. He said, Uh-oh. well, you guys have got to be running out of ideas. That's why I threw four at him right now. Uh- <laughs> so, yep. That's pretty funny. <laughs> so uh, we also want to uh, tell you that we are on Instagram at pray for the number four yens. Uh, we are, uh, which I just love that handle, uh, we are on uh, Twitter um, at Pray for Yens. Uh, last week, we actually had our first uh, Brass Junkies conversation uh, with the hashtag Brass Junkies Convo, which Lance doesn't even know. Um, but uh, we uh, had people, really good. We had people weigh in. <laughs> Lance is in charge of all social media. We had uh, people weigh in on what their instrument was and what their uh, what their warm up book of preference is. Uh, we got another one um, that, uh, if you listen to this, the day it comes out will be tomorrow on Wednesday. Uh, that's already lined up, and um, yeah, that's uh, that's about it, I think. Oh, and, and Patreon for the people who uh, who support us through Patreon. Thank you so much. We are on our way to our next goal of seventy five dollars. You can check that out at patreon.com slash the brass junkies. And um, also, we are getting dangerously close to our goals of ratings and reviews on iTunes. So please do not help uh, push us over the finish line there, because that would be awful. True. So. Oh, and Patreon folks have been getting some additional content. They got the trumpet pictures, and they actually, uh, well, let's see, by the time this airs, uh, about a week prior to the airing of this, they got a special um, Patreon patron only uh, mini episode that Andrew and I threw together, and we've got some other things in the works. So if you've been thinking about um, helping, um, might be a good time to do it because we have a whole bunch of uh, uh, content that is patron only. Yes. Going up. So we're going to continue to do the show just as we've been doing it. That won't change, but we're adding some additional stuff and for those got, who've uh, gone the extra yard. Yeah, there's going to be um, – and that can be for as little as a, as a dollar per episode, meaning like a whopping 50, uh, $52 dollars a year um, The because uh, it's every other week. I had to do math there. So that was complicated. $26? $26, yeah, it would. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, you went you to go. Northwestern. Wow. Yes, I did. What'd you major in? Music. Oh, that makes sense. Um, <laughs> the uh, I've had that conversation on many airplanes. Um, the uh, what the, was your job in the Air Force? Yeah, when I was in the band. No, I'm like, what was your? I know, I got the. I understand you were in the band, but what was your job? Uh, yeah. We've um, we are going to do a uh, a bonus episode uh, every single month, uh, and um, as and also which is uh, already started, and that's going to continue moving forward, and all for the Patreon people, um, and uh, also we are uh, there's going to be a few uh, random special interviews with folks. I just interviewed Andrew Dockerty, who is a former student of mine, who uh, barely a week ago won the tuba audition for the West Point band. Um, and uh, he uh, gave a, a long, uh, it, was, it was actually awesome in two parts that are going to be coming out. This is patron only, um, talking about the entire audition process from the making of the tape to the showing up at the hotel the night before to what the day looked like and pulling numbers and everything. And just if you ever wondered what exactly a day like that looks like. And then also he went into great detail about all of his audition prep, which was really fascinating uh, for me. So um, he credited 99% of it to studying with me at George Mason, So, which was very Why kind. wouldn't he? Yeah, which may, I might be paraphrasing. 
Um, but, uh, you know, federally was only 1% of that. Yeah, I, I think that I might have had that actually backwards. But um, but I digress. Uh, so, um, but yeah, he worked his tail off. You hear about his prep, and it's not a mystery as to why he won. So if you ever Wait, wonder. he had a tail? And it's gone. <laughs> it is gone, which is good. He's getting Holy married cow. soon. I want to get married with a tail. So Yeah, I'm um, my pants. So anyway, this is a long intro. So should we even, I don't know, should we include the Pete interview, or should we just call it? We're already at 10 minutes i think we're good yeah, yeah i think okay. we're good too so thank you for see tuning in, two in. Weeks. yeah see you in two weeks um yeah that would probably piss pete off so um and i've never <laughs> seen him mad i don't think i'd want to though he's always smiling but i bet you you know i bet yeah he's uh i don't think i'd want to mess with him so no. um but uh because he's a knucklehead that's the fourth time i've said that so without further ado here is our conversation with a uh, fellow knucklehead and uh famous composer pete meekin and today we are joined by a good friend of ours who is a prolific composer. Uh, he is a, uh, a world-renowned husband. Uh, he is a, um, he's, <laughs> he's dedicated his life to charity. Uh, he has, uh, what else has he done, Lance? Triathlete. Tri- triathlete. Um, and uh, he actually invented Tupperware. Uh, this is uh, British-born but now Canadian composer Pete Meekin. Pete, how are you this morning? I'm I'm very good, and at least half of my wives will endorse what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how many? How many? How many? I'm assuming that there's only one that's current, and then there's maybe some past oh, tense. Yeah, yeah. There's one, one, one at a time, one at a time, and <laughs> the first one just couldn't handle the amount of training and dedication I gave to my triathlete career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, I had a similar problem. Yeah, that's, that's exactly, yeah, you triathletes, you just, you get going and it's just like, you know, like the family be damned, career be damned, you know, you just, you just got to yeah. do it. So here's a pop quiz for you. What are the three events in a triathlon? <laughs> This Drinking. is the one where, I was going to say, you, you, start, you start with a whiskey, yeah. followed by, by a pint of British beer, and, and end up with a curry, right? That's, I think that's, that's, that's called the Manchester Triathlon. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We've, uh, you know, Lance and I have both competed in that a few times. Not as many times as you have, of course. But um, So that actually uh, leads me to, um, well, let's... Let's talk about um, about you going to school in Manchester, and I love the fact that you were the the manager. Well, first of all, was, I was blown away when I first international Boston brass trip was. Um, this was pre Lance, uh, P P L as we call it, um, was to Manchester for the ITG in uh, two thousand and two. And for anyone who doesn't know, that's the International Trumpet Guild, which is actually happening right now. That's when trumpet players all get together and talk about how great they are. Um, to each other um, while they look over the shoulder of the person they're talking to to see if there's a more famous trumpet player that happens to be nearby that they could go talk to. So that's that summed it up pretty well, right? Pretty well. <laughs> yeah. It's like Midwest on uh, on steroids. So, um, But uh, we were over there, and there is a there is at the, at the Royal Northern uh, College of Music, there is a, a bar that's in the school. <laughs> So and then like and everyone goes there and of course uh, our knucklehead guest here managed to become the manager of that bar. So, but I love how that ended up leading to you networking and meeting everybody, and that kind of launched your composition career in a lot of ways. So, can you uh, talk to us about how you somehow finagled your way into managing the bar? Well, I was desperate for money. And the actual person who ran it, the official manager, was desperate not to work. And so it seemed like a, <laughs> a good symbiotic relationship. That's a win-win. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, I was going to say you should partner with Lance in something then, except for the fact that he doesn't have a lot of money to pay you. But he's desperate to not work as well. So mm-hmm. <laughs> try, try composing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good idea. It's a good idea. Rim shot. <laughs> <laughs> pretty funny so, so was your degree in composition yeah so uh so i was 18 when i went up to the the rncm in manchester and uh, uh it was it's a pure degree in composition so i've got all my education my, my, my college degrees are, are in composition rather than a broader music degree 
so yeah from from the start it was kind of very focused and what what drew you to do that you know i have absolutely no idea i i feel like where i've ended up today doing what i'm doing has been a series of um lucky indecisions <laughs> that it was just easier just to to take the path of least resistance and and then you kind of find yourself with someone wanting to write a piece. Well, you know, shucks, yeah, I'll write a piece. And then someone else wants you to write a piece. And then you write another piece. And then you go and do another degree. And well, what do you do after that degree? You do a, a, a doctorate or something. And, and then, well, I've got a doctorate now and a few commissions lined up this year. It, so it was. I don't feel it was ever really a choice. I think it was probably just that it, it happened without me being aware of it. And if I'd have thought about it, I'd have probably become a lawyer or something like that you know hmm. where you can so make this... a difference in the world and, and earn you know huge amounts of money so you the opportunities kept showing up you just kept taking advantage of the opportunities and it just grew and grew and grew on it right and and you don't know that they are opportunity like that you don't realize they're opportunities it's just you're doing what you want to do and and it's and it's funny i can even trace me being living here in canada back to a performance uh, that I heard, not of any of my music, uh, when I first met Rex Richardson, um, sort of back in 2007, I think it was. And, and I heard him play and, and wow, it just absolutely blew me away. And, and I ended up writing a piece for Rex, which uh, Jens Lindemann then did over in Canada. It turned out I had a friend who was over here in Saskatchewan in Canada. And that's where I met my wife, and the rest is is sort of history. So the the funny thing is that you never quite know where any of these opportunities are going to take you in music, in life, in in anything. So um, certainly in terms of a composing career, you're just happy if you've got a gig mm -hmm. you know, at that stage. And and if you have another gig lined up after the current gig you're on, then well, that just feels like a, a hole in one. You know, that's that's as as good as it gets. And and at some point you realize you've got, you're not worrying about where the next commission comes from or how you're paying the next month's rent. You're, you're worried about how you pay the rent and six months from now and how you do the commission. Uh, you know, who's going to commission you six months from now? And then the worry never goes away. It's like, well, okay, 2018 is, it's looking okay, but what about the back half of 2018? And suddenly you realize you're a, you're, you're a year away and, and you're already more booked up than you ever have been. And, and you can't really have a place where that, happened it just it's a very organic process you know it just sort mm -hmm. of starts starts happening and yeah people i'm fortunate that people seem to find something in my music that they say you know what we'd like to to have part of that in in what we do and uh, it's a very sort of privileged and and lucky existence really that the, there's plenty of music already in the world you know hmm. and and uh, and so to have new music is a uh, uh, is is an extra on top of it. People would mm -hmm. still people would still love music if there wasn't new music, because people still love Beethoven and rightly so. It's just that you know we have uh, uh, an ability right now, and we know these are pretty difficult times in the world. We have ability right now to have to have music that relates directly to what's happening today, and then what happens is the music becomes part of the healing process. It becomes part of everyday living. And we've got an opportunity actually to just keep um, balancing out the, um, I don't even know how to refer to these people without swearing, by the way, because I only swear about them. But these people who do the unspeakable things like they did back in Manchester just recently, mm -hmm. you, you balance it by telling stories through music that brings people together. The people of Manchester came out on the streets the day after and were singing songs by Manchester bands. There was poetry and there was love in the streets. There was art everywhere. And actually, um, it turns out that we we have answers to how we move forward. They exist. And and I think that new music is is part of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Powerful. Do you, <clears throat> do, how much... I mean, you talked about the fact that there's this kind of uh, worries the right word. Well, I, I don't know, however you describe it, that at some point in the future, there are there's nothing lined up. And so you've got when when 
we were in the quintet, like every year it was kind of a clean slate. You know, it's like once January 1st hits, then there's nothing on the book. So do you, how do you go about um, finding new commissions? Like, are you, are you actively marketing? Are they coming to you more? Are they, what, what's, how is that happening now? I'd say there's, there's probably two, there's two, there's a two part answer for that. I'd say part one is a lot of people will contact me and say, this is a piece we want. Um, would you be willing to write it? And usually I have to find uh, my own path into it. You know, if, if so-and-so concert band comes to me and says, oh, we're celebrating our 40th anniversary, could you write a fanfare? I, I kind of usually say no to that because you know what? I've got no... I've got no buy-in for that. If they come to me and say, hey, it's our 40th anniversary, uh, we'd really love a new piece of music, then actually I can spend a bit of time and, 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 and uh, look at the history maybe of the town, of the band, or maybe just propose something that, that, that's been in the back of my mind anyway. So there's the one that comes in, and then there's the one where um, I kind of have an idea of a piece. There's something I really want to write, and you maybe find a friend and you'll say, hey, this is kind of a piece I'm interested in. You know, what, what, what are the chances that we can make this work either for a premiere, for a commission, maybe get a consortium together, however, however uh, that works. And I think even, even if I was, you know, completely jam-packed booked and I never want to be there because I like the time off between pieces, but uh, even if I was jam-packed booked, I, I, I think I'd still... Um, search for the, the the opportunities to write the exact piece I want because that's where your sort of soul lives and and doesn't live, right? You've got to find no composer. In fact, I don't think any musician really, but no composer gets into it to write uh, anything but what's completely in their hearts and minds. And so, and sometimes that balance changes. It's not always 50-50, of course, but... Um, and so from that point of view, I think it's it's important to always write the music that you very purely want to write as opposed to the music that you, of course, want to write and, and is all about you and your heart and soul, but but just doesn't have that little nth degree of, 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 uh, of what you've dreamed of, as it were. Mm -hmm. So uh, I meant to, at the very beginning, and maybe we'll throw this in the uh, intro if I remember, but, um, <clears throat> but meant to plug that... Uh, uh, Pete did a, a great interview for the entrepreneurial musician um, for me for episode 87, uh, and uh, it was it was really great. It was uh, fascinating to hear um, a lot of the the tales, and you know he's talking about indecision and luck, and yes, the, a lot of that played a part. But you hear his story like in detail, and um, and it's not really a mystery that he's been played by so many um, great people. Um, can you, uh, for uh, example, can you talk about, uh, you mentioned briefly uh, writing that piece for Rex, Rex Richardson. <laughs> Rex? Rex? Rex. Rex Rickerson. <laughs> I think that's Freudian his, slip much? I think that's his new name on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> Rex Rickerson. Um, we interviewed him early with the Brass Junkies and... Uh, that was before I figured out that if there's like a bad connection, you just have to just like say stop and pull the plug. And we kind of did the interview with him and it came out like, okay, but it was a little painful. We learned that lesson the hard way from Joe Alessi where, which is like our most listened to episode and the connection's really terrible. But anyway, so we listened to it and then Lance and I talked to her we like, are we going to, yeah, we're going to do this. So that's when I like, I called him. I was like, Hey man. He was like, yeah. I was like, so you know how we're really yeah. good friends. Right. And he said, go ahead, Lance. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, do you? So, so you remember that interview that we did for the Brass Junkies? Yeah. <laughs> well, well, the uh, it's really almost unlistenable because of the connection. So, uh, so we're gonna do it again. Cool man. <laughs> that, was like, that was literal. You cats, you cats got that figured out yet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, good luck on your upcoming tour, Rex, to Uzbekistan and uh, Inner Mongolia and um, and Laos. Thanks, bro. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> oh, we hadn't had a good uh, Lance uh, Rex Richardson impersonation in a while. <laughs> Look at Pete. Pete, it's eight. It's eight twenty-four in the morning, and Pete's crying. He's laughing so hard. There you go. Um, so, can you tell the story about how y- you writing that piece for Rex Richardson was the result of a, of a cold call? Right, like he didn't even know who the heck you were. You hadn't even met yet. No. So, tell that story. So I, I, I was basically, I was broke. I had no money. I was, uh, uh, I, I don't remember if I was working in a, a gas station at the time or, or what I was doing something. I, I was broke. I had no money. I'd figured out, you know, I'd left college and I'd figured out that despite, you know, meandering my way through college and, and kind of tripping up and finding a degree at the end of it, I kind of uh, realized in that time when not, writing particularly after college that that's what I really wanted to do and in the UK I was, I'd spent a lot of time with brass bands and and, uh, and and still love writing for brass band probably more than any ensemble really still and uh, and of course the place you need to be is the national championships which are held at the Royal Albert Hall uh, every October and I was I was broke and I couldn't go down and, and that's where you need to be to meet the players meet the conductors meet the administrators and uh, and there was a brass band magazine and, and and called the British Bandsman and the owner of that uh, he he rang me up and said Pete if you can get down to to London I've got a spare hotel room but the catch is you'll have to review the concert the the gala concert the night before the competition uh, and I'll give you 50 pounds to do that so I was lucky enough that one of the Manchester bands was down in London that year for the, the national final. So I jumped on their bus. I had 50 pounds to spend on beer, which of course I couldn't, um, I couldn't spend until I'd heard this concert and I'd reviewed this concert because, you know, I'm a pro. And <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly pro what, what I was thinking, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he got that from his triathlete past. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just <laughs> it's, it's the oldest profession. Been a pro. <laughs> <laughs> a pro reviewer, of course, because that's yeah. you know that's essentially what the good book is. So, uh, we, uh, so, so I go down there and and I I've just offended like half of America, which is you know a lot of your a lot of your listeners. I'm sorry, guys. Um, the sound uh, yeah, so I, so I yeah I I go down there and this concert. Uh, X. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> you should hear I'm him at eight. Remember the question. You should hear him at eight p.m., ladies and gentlemen. All right, so <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't get any better. <laughs> so slurs, slurs a bit more at eight p.m. Yeah. So all right, so you're reviewing a concert and you're about to go talk to Wretch Rickerson. Yeah. Well, he he plays like this is the first time I've heard him play ever it's first time i've come across him and it just absolutely blew my mind because he's, he's pretty he's good such a spectacular player as, as we all know and uh and he he did a, a couple of contemporary pieces he did, I, I tell you he did the um alan vasuti rising sun piece which is great because it features the different uh the different trumpets the flugel the the pick and the trumpet and then uh he he did a couple of jazz numbers and it was just absolutely great and and I was doing my PhD at the time. I, I think I was about to do my PhD, and and I kind of decided that uh, I really wanted to write a, for want of a better term, a crossover piece. I wanted to introduce a bit of improvisation in my piece, and and I wanted a play of a certain style that I could trust to write it for. And so, in fact, it was the very early days of Facebook, and I I found Rex on Facebook and dropped him a note saying, "Hey man, you know, I just I just heard you play, and and it really was." something special and, and I'd really really like to write you a piece and you know like you say that's a cold call from somebody who he has no idea who it is some dude over in England and uh well he 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 got straight back to me gave me his email address and I sent through a few uh a few sound files of pieces that I'd written before and unfortunately a couple of them were for people he knew uh, so for instance there was a piece for Steve Mead the euphonium soloist uh, which only knew Steve from uh, Battle Creek Brass Band. And so it kind of was a nice little in. And Rex, Rex got back to me and, and said, man, I, I really dig your music. And 
let's 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 talk about this and we made the project happen and and uh, he came over to I think it was 2009 was the premiere over in in England and he came over to the the, the college of music in Manchester there and uh, yeah the rest the rest just formed part of my uh, every every sort of step that I've ever taken really because the next thing that happened was at the interval of that concert, conducting the second half of, of the, the concert was Bramwell Tovey, who is uh, also a conductor that, that virtually everybody in the world knows now. I mean, he's, he's spectacular. And he conducts a brass band in the UK, comes back and still conducts them. And he said, well, you've got to send this to my friend over in, in Canada because he's a very good trumpet player. And, you know, I think this is the sort of piece he'd like. And that was Jens. And so... Um, uh, Jens actually responded to my email, which um, <laughs> I don't know, the stars aligned, or, <laughs> or there was there was a very special moment or something. Uh, maybe he was stuck in an airport. I don't know what it was. He he, he found my email and he, he responded, and and we then spoke on the phone. And yeah, he he ended up doing it over in Canada. I uh, came over for the performance, and then you know. Like I say, that's how I ended up here. There you go. Pretty neat story. So, so do you have... Uh, well, there's no problem, man. <laughs> i do anything for you, dog. <laughs> I love you, man. I just... No, I just, I I just, just dig <laughs> what you do. And if I can help you in some way, I, I'm down. I just... I just texted him. We were interviewing Pete Meekin right now for the Brass Junkies, and I accidentally called you Rec, R Retch Rickerson, and then I reenacted a conversation with you with Lance doing an extended impersonation. Pete was crying. <laughs> End text. Oh, you cats are crazy. That's exactly what I thought he was going to come back with. You cats are crazy. So we'll see. If he gets back to me while the interview is still going, then I will, I'll, I'll update us in real time here. So... <laughs> So Pete, what if uh, yeah. how would you, how do you describe your music? Oh man, uh, introspective. Yeah, that's that's uh, <laughs> that's a that's a, it's, it's a horrible question for a composer to answer. That yet we should be well, you we should can't be generalize it. All. I understand. <laughs> uh, well, it's I, I think I think I would say that there's a, a lot of um, it's very. Uh, there's a high emotional content in 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 what I do. I a lot of stuff I write about is is very serious subject matters, which is somewhat ironic if you actually know me, I guess. But it's very very serious subject matters, and uh, so the music often has a very serious nature and 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 a very emotional nature. Um, so that kind of describes a bigger picture of it, I guess. Uh, and mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the actual nuts and bolts of music. I, I, I always think that I'm more tonal composer than, than not. But I, I my, my whole theory on composition is that it's now the year 2017. It should be okay to write whatever you want. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we no longer belong in an era, and we no longer sort of. There's so many different composers doing so, writing so much brilliant music that we all get to write how we want and where we want. And the very cool thing about that is that the internet has brought the world into a very, very small place, um, which means that for everybody, whether you're a good composer or not, there's actually someone out there who will like your music. And so there's more people writing music now uh, and having music performed than I think probably ever. And the very, very cool thing about that is that, um, that it means that more people are interested in commissioning music. And more people are in, uh, more interested in getting involved in speaking to composers and not just seeing the name on the top of the the piece of the paper. And and, and you know what, you go into universities or something like that, and, and if it's a good program, it's like Shirk yeah, here's our fourth composer of the week who's coming in for a, a rehearsal. But when you go into say a high school or something like that, they it it makes quite an impact for them to see a composer. I had a new piece done. Uh, last Wednesday night, when was that? Two nights ago. And for the first rehearsal that I went into for that, because uh, it was here in town in Regina with a silent V. And we... <laughs> we uh, <laughs> there you we, go. <laughs> I go into the rehearsal, and there's these high school kids, and they're about to 
to, to run it through. This is the first time I'm hearing it. When the tuba player says, sort of puts his hand up and stops the conductor, and and she somewhat frustratedly said, "What?" And he he, he said, "Well, I've got a question for the composer." She said, "Well, in that case, of course, because you know that's why we have them here." And he said, "Is this the first time you've ever heard it?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, it is." He says, "So we've all heard it before you." I was like, "Yeah, man, that's so cool. <laughs> How is that possible?" How how can you not have like the instruments there and know what it sounds like? I'm like, oh well, you know, and then you can start a conversation about actually how music relates to performers, relates to what's in your mind and all the rest of it. And from there, really what happens is is they get a slightly deeper understanding of music. They get a slightly wider view of how music is made and and you hopefully, you know, I I, I say to them, you know, whatever I say, so I'm, I'm a big one for whole notes. I hate this, put the finger in down, count to four, and then maybe move on beat one again, you know, on the next measure if you're lucky. Like, I, I, it's, it's a weird teaching to just teach someone to put the right finger in down, put the breath through the instrument and count to four, because really that's only the very beginnings of the note. You know, how do you get to the next note? Is the next note a higher long note or a lower long note? You know, is it a more intense note, a less intense note? And and kids get these concepts really, really, really quickly. And um, and they'll apply it to your piece. And then the other pieces they're playing, they're just like, oh, well, I've never met this composer, dude. So so I can I can play this music however I want. And then so you, you actually get to stay and work with them a little bit on the other pieces and, and apply those same principles. And it starts to make the connection that actually these are real people that have written it and um, and, it, and it kind of, composers are held aloft by society as these kind of almost beings above other musicians. And I find it very, very strange. Like they somehow don't imagine that a composer can, can drink beer, watch the soccer and have two dogs and, you know, all those kinds of things. And what I've just described is basically my life. <laughs> and... <laughs> They, I think I think a lot of people just presume that composers somehow live in this different world where we walk around looking for inspiration and, and finding the art in everything we see. But it's, you know, we're just all normal guys, right? You know, all of us, and we, we sit down and we, we chat and we talk and and then we all go off and do our jobs. It's just, it's it's no different. And it's good for the kids to, to see that. It's good for adults to see that as well, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hmm. That's a pretty cool story about that kid having their mind blown that they heard right. the piece before you. That's yeah, that, that's so obvious that that would be kind of an earth shattering moment for them. But I certainly wouldn't have thought of it. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> huh. yeah. Who uh, who is on the scene right now that uh, you whose music? What other composers are you digging right now? Well, before I give you my list, I'd like to say I think they're all nearly as good as me. So if you're out there and wanting to commission someone, these are the guys you should go to after me. <laughs> but, um, after Pete turns you down for your 40th anniversary <laughs> fanfare, then you can hit up these guys. <laughs> uh, you, you, you know what? There's so much great music being written. And uh, there's some things that just blow my mind and some pieces that just blow my mind, some composers that blow my mind. Um, you know, I listened, uh, I listened, it was the President's Band, so it was just an incredible performance, of course, to a performance of John Mackey's Frozen Cathedral. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I'd, I'd heard it on, on, uh, on, you know, on my speakers before, but and I, I thought, well, you know, this is a, this is a nice piece, of course, because he writes great. He just, he's so good. But once you're in the hall and you're in the live setting with the antiphonal stuff, it's just... A, a completely inspired piece of music, and 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 I just, I just loved every second of of, of being in that performance, you know. Um, and and he he writes great, Steve Bright, and of course these are guys that are, uh, are huge names. I I love the music of my teacher Peter Graham. He uh, he he. Oh, my dogs are going crazy. I don't know whether you can hear that. They oh. are crazy dogs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> They're not a fan of your former teacher's music, evidently. Everybody's a critic. 
I think they're not, they're not a fan of someone knocking on our front door is, is mainly it. So unless that is Peter Graham knocking on my front door, then I think he's all right at the moment. You're in Canada. It's safe there. Yeah, well, you, you think that. He, he gets me everywhere. No, he is. He, he, uh, he, he's just a, a wonderful composer and, and was a brilliant teacher and an incredibly humble guy. And uh, I... I Whenever I mention his name to people, people will say, oh, yeah, I kind of know the name, but no one's ever really researched his music and discovered his music. Um, and he just writes with such clarity that it's just uh, very, very, uh, very wonderful to listen to, you know, very economic, such clarity. Um, there's so many good composers and good uh, pieces of music being written. I mean, it's a good time to to be alive as, as a uh, as a conductor i think you've got so much option in front of you um i'd probably balance that by saying uh by saying there's, there's a lot of bad music as well <laughs> um uh, and and by that i guess uh i all <laughs> I always tell kids when I'm working with high school kids, and I, I say, what do you like about that? Oh, it's good or it's bad. I say, no, we don't use good or bad, but I use it all the time. Uh, the reason is, <laughs> do as I say, children. Right. Do as I do. Uh, the, the, reason, the, reason, the, the reason is, is because there's no, there's, no, um, there's no filters anymore, right? Mm -hmm. 30 years ago, you had to go to a publisher to get published because that was the only way you could get your music out there. So it had to go through an artistic department. It had to go through a commercial department. And even then, they had to pour a ton of money into the promotional budget to record the piece uh, to a high standard and then produce the 2,000 CDs that they give away at Midwest every year or wherever. And and so it it, it, it there was a huge vetting process. And, and that's before you could even get onto the, the desk of those people, right? There was, a, uh, there was vetting processes locally and... Whereas now you just put it into Sibelius or Finale and put it on your website and and no one really cares about good recordings anymore. I don't know if you've noticed that, but like, you know, band directors don't need to hear the perfect recording played by the University of North Texas or something. They need to hear just an idea of how it goes. And, and if it's free and on YouTube, then all the better. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, and by the way, this is, sorry, I'm just talking a lot, but the, the, the byproduct you, of that you are is, you are being interviewed so it's kind of yeah it's kind of yeah, what we were looking for <laughs> yep <laughs> but usually you do you didn't talk questions. very much yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the, the, the flip side to it which is going to be a very good and positive flip side to us is the CDs no longer make money and the reason that is good is that it means that when people make CDs it's an investment of more than just hoping to make money out of it, right? It's not a financial investment that you look to, to add to a tour and make a few extra bucks on the way. It is now to say something of artistic value, or that's presumably the intent. That's a cool angle to that, which I hadn't really put that fine a point on it, and that's that's really a good point. Yeah, huh. because that's, that's then your best business card, right? It's the the anti YouTube, the counter YouTube, you know, it's the, it's saying that to me, quality matters so much that I'm willing to invest all the time, effort, energy, finances, organizational capacity into producing this product that I am so unbelievably happy and proud of. And that's, that's, that's gonna, that's gonna mean for some awesome music making for all of us over the next period of time i don't know how long it'll be 10 years 20 years but it'll be great hmm. wow um you mentioned that um that uh, you mentioned soccer before um which you you people call football um which makes sense since you pretty much only use your feet but americans we can screw anything up um so so we did um the um, yeah the, <laughs> which that was a joke anyway uh the um <laughs> a pull up pull up pull up all right here we go um, you are, uh, you're a big Liverpool fan, right? I am. Yeah. Yeah. You must've been an addict. Yeah. yeah. More of an addict. You must've been happy with how the season ended there with, uh, winning on the final day, right. To make the top four. Yeah. We somehow managed to, to, to stumble over the line. It, it, 
it reminded me of the final triathlon I did. You know, where, <laughs> <clears throat> where, where despite all your best efforts, you still finished. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, yeah. And you no, you wrote a uh, you wrote a piece uh, called uh, Epitaph for Hillsboro um, for uh, for Brass Band. Can you? Um, I'm guessing a whole bunch of people do not know um, the story about what <laughs> happened um, at Hillsboro Stadium back in 1989. And so, can you give us a little bit of a, of what that was about, and then talk about the piece? Yeah, of course. Well, I, it was actually a wind band piece. Oh. I then. It's, well, it's the only wind band piece I've ever tr- transcribed for brass band. I knew, I knew I, that. I, I did my research. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll just quickly explain why. Because, like, it's very easy to go for. I, I always see brass band to wind band like going from black and white TV to color TV, and uh, it doesn't always work the other way around because they have opposite pro- problems, right? You know, the the brass band is all, all low and no high, and the wind band is all high and no low. So, it it doesn't always work that well, but. But with this piece, it did, and it was important because of, of, of what this piece means to me. So back in 1989, uh, there was an FA Cup semi-final, which I guess is <clears throat> that'd be like the, the you know the divisional playoffs before the Super Bowl equivalent. It's a big deal. Um, it's a, a very big deal, and it was between two teams, Liverpool and Nottingham Forest, and, and we played each other the year before, and we were huge rivals for for ten years, and. Uh, and this this game was nationally televised, and it was r- highly anticipated. And uh, and it's played on a neutral ground. They don't play home and away. They always play the the, the semi-finals, as we call them, semi-finals, I guess, uh, on on neutral grounds. And and this particular ground is is maybe around eighty miles from Liverpool, and there'd been construction on the motorway, so people were a little bit late getting there. The policing outside the ground they used to have checkpoints the year before. They had checkpoints every mile or so, and they got rid of those for presumably financial reasons. I'm not sure what the actual reasons were. And and this ground was a substandard ground. It didn't have the proper safety certificates. It turns out they couldn't even get ambulances on the pitch because uh, there was there was nothing. There was no entrance way tall enough to allow an ambulance through, and all this kind of crazy stuff. And and it was the perfect storm where something could have gone wrong if the conditions uh, happened. And unfortunately, on that day, they did. And, and um, there was a buildup of people outside the ground because there wasn't enough turnstiles to get people in uh, quickly. And so the police chief, who I think this was the first match that he was in charge of, which is in itself an insane decision, uh, decided to open the, the, the barrier that is for when fans want to leave and uh, and just let in all the fans. And of course, there was a huge amount of people and uh, the, they all tell the stories of how their feet basically didn't touch the ground. The momentum took them uh, towards the tunnel right in front of them, which was into the center pens of this one particular stand, um, one particular terrace. And in those days, uh, you used to watch soccer in cages in pens because um, Margaret Thatcher thought all soccer fans were hooligans and and hooligans are animals, therefore you lock them up like caged animals. And this, of course, um, meant that all those at the front of the the pen uh, and and elsewhere in the pen were were, were crushed to death and 96 people uh, died pretty much standing up. uh, And it turned out that the police... Um, minutes after making that decision to open the gate, were already covering up what was going on, and um, because they were busy covering up what they were what was going on, uh, they weren't actually helping the dying fans. Uh, they also were leaking to the press that fans were drunk and rioting. Of course, none of this happened, and very very quickly, the what happened was a, a, a story of that, that didn't actually have any relation to. The, the truth and there was cover up after cover up after cover up and it took you know it took a generation to get another inquest which only happened uh, last year uh, and the and a brand new inquest came out and and uh, you know overturned all these verdicts of <clears throat> accidental death and 
A lot of mothers had died without signing death certificates because they refused to um, uh, acknowledge that their their sons or daughters or mothers or fathers, you know, were 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 killed by accidental death because it wasn't an accident. There were people to blame, and and now we're in the process of working out what justice is because a lot of the people who are to blame are, uh, are now dead, in, including Margaret Thatcher, and 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 so I don't know what justice will look like for those people. Um, but for 20, 20 years, no one listened to them. And and as a Liverpool fan, part of, part of your duty is to not only watch your team and, and support your team, uh, but you support those families and you support the cause. And and this was just my, um, I guess this was just my little contribution to make sure that I get to tell that story everywhere in the world because. You know, when you start reading it, you'd think it was some sort of third world banana republic. Or this was happening in China or something where they're covering up a mysterious death or whatever because it's the government's responsibility. This was this was in England and continued throughout my lifetime until recently to be something that was covered up by successive governments from different sides of the political spectrum. And, and thankfully now they have some sort of I don't know if it's peace or closure, but they certainly have answers. Hmm. And you, like millions of people, watched this live on TV, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember, I remember watching it and not knowing what was going on. I mean, yeah, it was it was insane. Crazy. Well, it wasn't <clears throat> it wasn't that. I mean, I guess it depends on how you measure, but the the Who concert in Cincinnati was a similar thing, and that was probably right. what nineteen. 19- 81, 82, something like that. And yeah. It, it's impossible to think that it's a thing that could happen and then for it to happen more than once and yeah. then to cover it up. And that is just, uh, it makes you wonder. There's a lot of head scratching there. Crazy. It, do, it does. And it's, you know, it was learned from and it changed the world. And in fact, it, it led to the Premier League that everyone now knows and loves all over the world. Because um, part of the thing was that all the stadiums, it turned out, weren't up to any kind of standard. And so these clubs all needed to refurbish or, or build new stadiums. And that costs a lot of money. And all of a sudden, Satellite TV with Rupert Murdoch came into the UK. And they were willing to take that kind of money in order to be able to to meet the standards that were then set in the aftermath of Hillsborough. So it, it still felt around the world today, you know, that... Uh, um, that that disaster and 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 now it's it's firmly imprinted in the British psyche. They they see what happened and and people know and and that's a good thing, you know. It yeah. is a good thing. So there's a uh, there's a recording of the um, the I believe it's the brass band version up on uh, <clears throat> up on SoundCloud that we are uh, throwing a uh, we'll throw a link in the show notes too, so you can check it out. The piece is six and a half minutes long, which is how long the match lasted. Um, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, yeah. There's uh, 96 strikes of the uh, tubular bells uh, in memory of each person who lost their life. It's uh, yeah, it's a powerful piece. So, if you want a uh, if you want an example of uh, and and uh, not all of your music is uh, is an epitaph and is that you know is that appropriately dark and uh, you know but uh, but there, that's some some great writing by you. So so speaking of which, before we run out of time, um, it would be insane if we didn't ask you that not too long ago. You had a uh, you had one of your solos was performed by some guy named Ryan Anthony, and uh, the uh, the backup band that you were able to uh, to acquire was the President's Own Marine Band, uh, with uh, Terry Austin, who uh, was in addition to the officiant of my wedding, which is absolutely at the top of his LinkedIn profile, um, is also the director of bands at uh, at VCU, uh, where uh, where Rich Rickerson uh, teaches. <coughs> Um, so can you uh, talk to us? Um, well, tell us uh, what the piece was and then tell us what the heck it was like to hear Ryan. And I know you'd heard him. You wrote the piece for him. But hearing him with the President's Own Marine Band and, by the way, Terry Austin, who recently, um, you know, you know, survived a, a, a battle with cancer himself. is like so many layers to this story. I would love to have been you for that day. Just that day, to be clear. But just that day. <laughs> maybe, maybe that hour. 
it's, it's 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 a pretty tough existence. You're right, just to, to narrow it down to a singular day. Uh, well, that that piece, you know, that piece is just a good example of when you write something, you never know what's going to happen to it. And and this was written. It was actually kind of in a slightly different version, part of a a, a cornet concerto for cornet and brass band. It was the middle movement. And uh, Ryan always sort of pulled pull my leg, teased me a bit, saying, do you ever write anything cheerful or, or you know, that's not miserable? And and so I sent him this through saying, there, yeah, there we go. That's that's something that's not completely miserable. And uh, <laughs> Here's the one. Uh, yeah, it is, this is the one I've managed so far. <laughs> hey, man, yeah. Liverpool made the one on the final day, made the final four. Yeah, we stumbled across the finish line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Now I'm going to go write some miserable music. <laughs> Listen, as, as you well know, I'm a Patriots fan as well. And, yep. uh, and uh, I got to tell you, I was pretty happy that night. Anyway, that's... that's. Uh, Turns out that's I it. was too. Yeah, we had, we had a very funny Facebook conversation. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I said, so when is it we give up hope? <laughs> and you said, I think right about now. I said, well, I'm not ready to just yet. Yeah, I was... <laughs> I was, uh, yeah, I posted like right before halftime. I posted like, I'm done with this. I'm going to bed. And, uh, and, and I, I, of course, didn't go to bed. But then people were, were trying to give me crap for, for having posted that. And I then, I then wrote the next day, I said, if you're trying to give me crap for being melodramatic about sports, then you've either literally never met me or you have a hard drug problem. <laughs> like it's kind of right. yeah. like calling the sky blue. But anyway. Um, yeah. So back to whatever we were talking about, yes. other than the greatest comeback in Super Bowl <laughs> history. Yeah. So well, it was. Um, uh, so, so I'd sent this this piece, this little piece to Ryan, and and he wrote back uh, 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 an extraordinary email, and that that was that was very sort of um, emotional, and and because of course I'm sure everyone knows about Ryan's uh, Ryan's battles with multiple myeloma and he continues to inspire everybody around him both musically and in terms of being a hero of a human being you know he's just he's just an incredible person and, and he sent me back this email and the, the the final gist of it was pete i need to do a couple of things i need to change the ending of this piece i need to you know make it a, it was a very reflective ending. he says i need it to be an optimistic ending i need to call it song of hope and it needs to be uh, a piece I can play everywhere with me. He says, so I need it with symphony. I need it with brass ensemble, with brass band, with wind band, with piano. I need it. I need all of this. And and also I need it to be, to have two or three soloists because this isn't, you know, this isn't a battle I'm doing alone. I'm doing it with with everybody. And, and, and so I want to be able to bring a principal trumpet of whatever ensemble I'm with up and come and play it with me. Or if there's other guest soloists, you know. And so, you know, it means a lot when someone like, Ryan finds something in your music, of course. And so uh, when Ryan asks, you say yes and, and make it happen. And and so <clears throat> I, I wrote this piece, uh, I rewrote this piece, sorry, and, and retitled it. And uh, and it was first done at the first Cancer Blows. This is Song um, for Hope. We actually haven't even said the title yet. Yeah. And uh, yes, it was... It was it was one of those occasions. I had food poisoning actually. I was really ill, and uh, I remember being in the airport on the way to Cancer Blows, thinking, "Man, maybe I just need to go back." And then I remember that, man, you've only got food poisoning. You you get there and you do it. <laughs> and it was one of those experiences that I'll I'll never forget. Because, uh, there was uh, there was there was Dallas Symphony Brass with the ensemble, the accompanying ensemble. There was Ryan, Dave Bilgem, and Mike Sachs. So that's three soloists to, you know. A pretty, they don't suck. They don't suck. <laughs> Thor and, uh, they thoroughly don't suck on a regular basis. Yeah, yeah, they they set new standards of absolutely not sucking. It absolutely <laughs> sucks. That's and, actually their and, next album. That's what they're going to call that. <laughs> yeah. New standards and not sucking. <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's a sex tape joke in there as well, but we'll move on. The, uh, uh, <laughs> Not before pointing out that you're moving on. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, uh, 
and, and they they and it was recorded because it's all part of the the DVD package that comes with um, that comes with the cancer blow stuff, uh, and and they recorded it and it and and Ryan released it onto the internet and that, and that was their they did that was their first they didn't rehearse it it was an open rehearsal recording session uh, with audience and they literally just played it and that's how they played it, you know that was their first run through and it was absolutely remarkable, and Ryan released it onto the internet and then. It's kind of it, there was one one group that shared it on Facebook and it had something like um, I think it was a hundred and no it's twelve twelve thousand views or something like that hmm. and that's 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 a, astonishing maybe it was more I can't remember whatever it was it was it was astonishing and it kind of grew legs and and Ryan had done it with Wind Band a few times because of course his dad's a, a band conductor um, and and so. When, when Terry Austin contacted me, um, in fact, I was staying with Terry uh, before the Midwest, and, and, and he's, he's a dear friend, and, and, and Terry and his wife, Tracia, are, are just wonderful, wonderful people um, who just make the world a much, much better place, as, as you know. Yes. And I was, I was staying with them, and, 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 and I played Terry the piece, um, and, and, and he loved it, and... and uh, a month or two later, he contacted me and said, Pete, at the American Bandmasters Association convention, I'm going to be conducting the Marine Band, and I'd really like to conduct Song of Hope. Mm. Um, and I was like, well, okay. Uh, <laughs> what, what, what do you need from me? He said, I'd love to do it with Ryan. So I, I passed on Ryan's email address, and as it worked out, the timing was just perfect for, for Ryan to come in. And... Um, you know what? Uh, that that ensemble is just astonishing, as as everyone listening will know. I mean, it's just astonishing. But really, none of that mattered because I got two very close friends, two people who've been with me every step of my musical career, and and two people who I just really, really love. At the end of that piece, who are both there, who are both embracing each other, and uh, you know what? That's uh, that was the best part of the performance. That that things could have gone a different way, and that might not have been the performance. You know, mm. and so and so. Really, I don't see that piece as as my piece. I just, you know, everyone finds their own meaning in it, and, and of course, with something like cancer, it affects us all one way or, or another. And so it's 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 out there for people to just uh, hopefully find something in for themselves and whether that's remembering someone or continuing in a fight or a battle or just a moment of just reflection whatever it may be that's that's all as a composer you can ask for with a piece of music you know that people find their own their own journey and their own meaning so yeah it was it was incredible hmm. good stuff that's beautiful yeah yeah good. <clears throat> what are you working on right now what's in the hopper uh, well, I've just, I've, I've just, um, about to finish a piece this morning, a, a, a fanfare for an event out in, in New York, Don Winston and friends. I don't know if you've come across this. Uh, Don's a, a, a incredible guy. He's a euphonium player and he puts together these, um, gatherings, I guess, uh, every year and he gets a load of, uh, great players in I think Demondre Thurman's quite often involved I know Joe Alessi is this year and, and he everyone comes in plays a bit of a recital and there's a good hang afterwards and he's he's commissioned a fanfare for the opening of that for I think it's like four tubers four euphoniums three trombones and two trumpets mm-hmm. so that was that was kind of fun to write so it's it's like power chords in the tubers you know it's <laughs> nice so it's a lot of fun. I feel like writing with distortion effects or something like there that. You go. <laughs> Open fifths, going baby. Full on, yeah, going full on metal. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, and then later in the year, there's going to be a new piece for 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 concert band and, and choir, which is 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 going to be a really great project to work on. It's going to be sort of for high school level. Uh, band and choir and the, and the piece essentially is going to be almost a sort of requiem mass type thing but with a bit of 
Robert Frost and various other more modern texts thrown in, and it's, it's just going to be a little bit about how, you know, we need a bit more peace and love in the world and all that kind of thing, because, of course, we're sadly lacking a lot of that right now. And so, so that'll be a very um, neat project to work on. And again, that's one of those projects where, sure, could you do it with a symphony orchestra and a 120-piece professional choir? Yes, but you know what? It's kind of more important that we do it uh, for school kids because then the message gets to the folks that need it, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> well, uh, we certainly can't let you out of here uh, without uh, asking if you uh, have any advice for uh, our dear friend uh, Jens Lindemann. Actually, I have an idea. I think that uh, maybe maybe Pete could write a piece for for Jens in honor of his chop problems, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's that's how you usually deal with uh, you know with adversity. <laughs> so you could <laughs> you could write him a piece. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but 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 he just stands there the whole time. He, he just he's just up front. He doesn't play a note. He like gets the water out. He just blows some wind through. Doesn't play a single note. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't no microphones near him either. <laughs> So, other than our idea, you're welcome uh, for your next uh, your next commission. Um, what, what what advice would you have for uh, for our and your dear friend uh, Jens Lindemann? You might have some unique insights now that you are a, a fellow Canadian. Mm -hmm. hey, well, hey. yeah, I mean, he's got to he's got to stay away from those beavers. That's, that's the first. <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> Uh, oh, that I did not expect, and I really appreciate. <laughs> anytime, anytime I don't expect something to come out of Pete Meekin's mouth, then I immediately blame myself <laughs> because <laughs> because to go because he's one of the sweetest humans that you could ever meet, as you can hear immediately when he's talking about you know like honoring the families that he never met like twenty something years later of that Hillsborough tragedy, and he's talking about the Ryan and and Terry and on Tracia and all that and then it's like but yeah but it's still pete <laughs> so <laughs> if you bring expectations to the table that's on you lance leduc or whoever else is listening to this so that's on you too rex richardson oh man i dig beavers <laughs> <laughs> by the way speaking speaking of rex he says we're crazy um and uh that he is in uh scotland <laughs> He is. In fact, he's he's he is going to be playing Song of Hope. I think uh, tomorrow. There you um, go. Well, yeah. he, he didn't. Uh, uh, yeah, he said I'm in Scotland now, not far from Pete's old stomping grounds. And then he said, unfortunately, I have to play Song of Hope tomorrow. No, I I added that last part. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I said I'm part Scottish. Those crazies are my people. And he wrote, makes sense with two exclamation points. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was it was it was a, a very serious question of, of, about Jens, and, and I feel like I made a bit of a joke at his expense. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, I saw him the other week at, at Cancer Blows, and uh, and 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 he was talking to me about it, uh, a very serious conversation. And I said, "Listen, dude, what what I what I'd really like is you know for you, I'm a big believer in looking after physical and mental health in equal capacities." And I said, "If this problem is really starting to get to you." But maybe the answer is just to use your mouth less. Mm. <laughs> I like it. I can't believe that you interrupted our joke about him at his expense to tell a joke at his expense. That was really, <laughs> was really, really rude of you, That's Pete. Next level, man. That's, That's Pete Meekin in a nutshell, right there, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, he's 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 up here in Regina in a couple of weeks' time, and I'm conducting him on 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 my piece, Apophenia. And it turns out that that really I didn't think about conductors when writing that piece because it's it's not easy to conduct. So so I just like to say that I really do love Jens very very much, and uh, and I hope the chop problems get better you know. <laughs> in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> well, well, there you go. Uh, well, this has been awesome and entertaining, and uh, we got to meet your dogs briefly, and. Um, yeah, and you're the one that's up at uh, at uh, eight a.m. Yeah, Lance has a has a little dog sleeping uh, right next to him. Uh, yep, there, 
There you go. That that makes for good radio right there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Hey, look at my dog. All of you people listening. Uh, so well, notice I didn't talk about it. I just showed the picture. You're the one that started prattling on about th- it. This is <laughs> prattle, 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 prattle. Uh, is that is that a dash, is that a dash home? Yep. Yeah, I've got two. I've got two miniature dash homes. Oh, how do you that's get them to do that? How do you get them to what? do that? How do you she get them to sleeps do that? all the that's... time. Yeah, she's very well. Do you want to swap? No problem. You can have my two. I'll have the out. <laughs> you, just Google Google dog safe Benadryl. <laughs> <laughs> that was a joke, animal people. Don't at me. That was a joke. <laughs> I have a friend. I have a friend. Chris Glushko is his name, and on Facebook, he does not have children. And uh, any t- sometimes when someone on Facebook will talk about like kids misbehaving on airplanes or something like that, he will he chimes in just to start a crap storm. He will chime in, say nothing that Benadryl, a little Benadryl won't fix. <laughs> and, then, and then he literally puts his feet up and makes some popcorn and just watches like just furious parents like chime in. And then as soon as it's going to die down, he kind of bumps the thread by. <laughs> Just come back in and like, I mean, I've seen him inspire like, like triple digit length comment uh, threads like on Facebook about like about the indignation about about him like you know you better not be giving your children Benadryl that's totally unethical and he doesn't have kids so yeah it's uh it's good stuff he's uh yeah that's 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 how you win Facebook right now so. That's about all it's good for these days. So, anyway, uh, Pete, thank you so much for uh, for waking up so early. Uh, but it sounds like you've got a commission to uh, to finish, anyways. So that house ain't yep. paying for itself. Yep. So uh, so stop talking to us <laughs> us us flunkies and go go get to work. Thank you so much, guys. Yeah, of uh, course, thanks, Pete. Yep, and uh, that is going to do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. <laughs> You've been listening to The Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com slash donate for more details. Also, be sure to check out our latest recording, The Brass Recording Project, at brassrecordingproject.com. The Brass Junkies is produced by Joey Santillo. Executive producers are Andrew Hitz and Lance LaDuke. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. Thank you.